Our last talk in this session is by Mariam Shatanawi, who is a curator of Middle Eastern and North African collections at the Tropen Museum in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. Um, her recent book um, analyzes the history of the Tropen Museum's Islamic collections, and its English translation is due to come out in the spring of 2013. Her talk today is titled Indonesian Islamic Art, the Historiography of a Neglected Heritage. Thank you. Well, thank you, and thank you all for staying uh, during this long day. After my talk, there will be coffee. Um, now something completely different, um, Indonesia. Um, what I'm going to present here today is part of an ongoing project on how Islam is uh, represented and uh, collected in Dutch museums, during which I developed a growing fascination with the absence, or total absence, almost total absence, of Indonesia in the narrative of Islamic art history. Um, when I joined the Tropi Museum uh, about 10 years ago, I expected to find a wealth of Indonesian Islamic material. This was not the case. Um, the Trobo Museum, being the former colonial museum of the Netherlands, has one of the largest and most important collections of art and material culture from Indonesia, once the Netherlands' prime colonial possession. Yet despite this long history, few objects in the collection have been identified as Islamic, and there's no terminology to denote Islamic stylistic influences. The situation in other museums with Indonesian collections is not much different. In my paper today, I will first uh, discuss the historical conditions leading to the Western disregard of Indonesian Islamic art, and then look to possible approaches to the concept of Islamic art in an Indonesian context. Um, yes. The general disregard of Indo Indonesia's Muslim heritage as a field of museum inquiry can be traced back to the Dutch colonial period. During this period, collecting in Dutch museums was strongly influenced by cultural policies of the colonial government that largely overlooked Indonesia's Islamic heritage. Although Muslims were by far the largest pro proportion of the populations of the Netherlands East Indies, and particularly the islands of Java and Sumatra, it's so about 80% um, of the population, the colony was represented either by its Hindu Buddhist heritage or the ethnic groups who were here, adhered to what the Dutch called primitive ancestral cults. Likewise, the formulation of a Western canon of Indonesian art and the emergence of the field of Islamic art simultaneously took place in the late 19th and early 20th century. I will argue here that although the two academic fields were geographically separated, Indonesian art history being dominated by Dutch scholarship, where Islamic art was studied and collected, not so much in the Netherlands, but in other European countries, as well as the US, and these two academic fields had little or no influence on each other. They shared an ideological foundation that framed their outlook on Islam. More specifically, the colonial scholarship of Indonesian culture was structured around the idea of an Islamic center and periphery that resembled the emerging scholarship of Islamic art of the same period. Toward the end of my paper, I'll discuss briefly what this implies for contemporary understandings of Indonesian Islamic art. To start with the Dutch side, um, the Dutch colonial disregard of Indonesian Islam in academic discourse as well as in the museum was the result of an interplay of several factors, which I can only discuss briefly here. First of all, the lack of interest was closely connected to the fear of the colonial authorities of Islam as a major threat to Dutch dominance in the Indonesian archipelago. During the two first uh, most important episodes of conquest and conflict, and I'm talking about the Java War, which took place um, between um, 1825 and 1830, and the Aceh War of 1873 up till the beginning of the 20th century. Um, during these two wars, a uh, local resistance movement framed their resistance to Dutch expansion in terms of jihad. As Dutch territorial expansion and cultural imperialism was continuous, continuously challenged by Islamic opposition, 
colonial discourse became increasingly ambivalent toward Islam. And the result was um, that in co governmental policies, political Islam was regulated, um, but cultural Islam downplayed or ignored. In collecting, this emphasis on Islam as a political force can be seen in the fact that a significant part of the Indonesian Islamic artifacts in the Trophy Museum's collection, and these are typically manuscripts and amulets, um, are assembled as war booty, war booty during these violent encounters. Secondly, Dutch colonial perceptions of Indonesian Islam departed from an uh, acculturation paradigm that identified an Islamic heartland where acculturation was complete, while Indonesia belonged to the periphery, which had only superficially absorbed Islamic influences. It's well known, of course. This dichotomy was reinforced by the dual track along which the study of Indonesia evolved. The Indonesian arts and cultures were the domain of Indology, while Islam was studied by scholars of Arabic and Oriental studies. Both uh, academic disciplines were, in a fashion typically of the 19th century, um, searching for a pure origin of culture. In the field of Islamic studies, Dutch scholars were strongly influenced by the German philo philological tradition and its emphasis on the origins of Islam, which were located theologically in its founding text, Quran and Hadith, and geographically in the Arabian Peninsula. Islamic practices outside the heartland were seen as a corruption of the real Islam of the Arabic heartland. And this idea was particularly vivid in the case of Indonesia, partly because Islam had reached Indonesia via India. So it was a double, um, a, a, it was doubly uh, indirect. When Dutch Indology emerged in the late 19th century, it emphasized the study and reco reconstruction of the Hindu and Buddhist monuments of Java as part of its search for the authentic core of Javanese culture. Later, under the influence of structuralism, Dutch in in Indologists described aspects of Javanese culture and religion as manifestations of ancient systems of classification that predated Islam and even Hinduism. These academic theories provided a, a scientific foundation for the disregard of Indonesian Islam as a cultural force in museums. Many scholars, administrators, and museum curators of the colonial period spoke of Islam as a superficial layer on top of essentially Hindu, Buddhist, or animist traditions. And I used popular metaphors that described Islam as a, a veil that concealed nothing and shapes nothing. Um, or a thin and easily flagging gaze. And the quote I have here on the slide is uh, by someone called um, Baron von Heuvel, and he was um, in charge of the Protestant uh, affairs in the, in the Netherlands East Indies, but he also collected some uh, objects for the Tropen Museum and then Colonial Museum. And this is a t just an example of such, a, such a, a statement. As he says that Mohammedanism in Java is a garment spread out, out of a society, but no living power that breeds life into people. It's an outward show, but no soul and spirit, a shape, but no substance. When scholars and museum curators did acknowledge Islamic influence, it was often described as a destructive force with negative impact on older artistic traditions which has resulted in the much lamented decline of Hindu Buddhist art. For instance, um, a 1987 exhibition um, titled uh, Budaya Indonesia uh, in the, at the Trouble Museum departed from a structural, structuralist notion of Indonesian civilization as based on ancient structures embellished by younger layers of Hindu Buddhist, Chinese and European influences. The exhibition summarized prevalent ideas about Islam as follows. There's full consensus on the view that there is no positive relation between Islam and the arts and crafts of Indonesia. The spread of Islam is held responsible for the disappearance of ancient artistic traditions without anything new or important replacing them." End of quote. So, um, this all translated um, into the exhibitions um, curated by the Colonial Institute. Um, this, what you see here on this slide, um, um, 
um, is, is the Dutch Pavilion in the World, um, Colonial World Exhibition in Paris in, in 1931. And what you see here is that by the low, late colonial period, pre-Islamic antiquities from Java had become the international symbol of the Dutch colonial empire, making Hindu Buddhist art the centerpiece of the Dutch contributions to world exhibitions. Marike Bloemberger has argued that the Dutch interest in pre-Islamic antiquities was related to the ethical policy, the Dutch equivalent of the civilizing, civilizing mission that became effective in 1901, resulting in a new a desire to pay respect to the culture of the colonized population, and in particular the elite who aided the Dutch in ruling the region. The antiquities provided a safe manner to pay respect to the Javanese elite, who were now represented as the bearers of the ancient Hindu Javanese civilization without having to pay respect to an important source of their authority, i.e. Islam, which was outside of Dutch control and in fact a direct rival of colonial authority. So um, when you look at the, 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 the exhibition that, uh, that's on the slide, you see that um, most of it are um, plastic has, um, taken from um, from um, well from Hindu temples um, and other monuments. Um, as you see here, the Buddhist statues. These are, these are also plastic has. And what you see here, this is a Dayak man, a mannequin of a Dayak man. Um, there are Balinese paintings here. Um, but the only sign of Muslim presence uh, in Java is actually this half cloth here. Um, besides that, um, and it, you can see, I can show you more slides of, this, of the same room, and it's all like this. Um, in the museum itself, um, there was a, a gallery that was called the Temple Room, which remained there from um, 1928 up to the 70s. And it also showed um, both um, plaster cast and some originals, um, again, of uh, statues and temple friezes from the different Hindu sites in Java. Uh, there was not such a room for Islamic art, of course. Um, well, i move up to today now. Um, the disregard of Indonesian Islam in Dutch cultural policies has had far-reaching consequences that last up till today, all the more so because their presumptions have seldom been challenged in the post-colonial period. An absence of reinterpretation of the colonial narrative and perhaps redirection of the existing collections, the representation of Indonesian art and culture in Western museums remains dominated by colonial paradigms. For instance, when the Colonial Institute um, widened its geographic scope to become the Tropen Museum following the independence of Indonesia in, in 1949, Islam was relegated to the Middle Eastern galleries, while the Southeast Asia galleries remained focused on Hindu-Buddhist heritage and the non-Muslim cultures of Indonesia. It is significant that even in the 1990s, or even today I would say, the Southeast Asia gallery contained only nine objects that were presented as Islamic out of a total of 1,217 objects. And I've calculated that's 0.7%. Um, in what follows, I will take a closer look to a number of objects in order to discuss what a future approach to the concept of Islamic art in an Indonesian context would, could entail. A first approach would be to look at influences of the Islamic art traditions of the so-called heartland on Indonesian art, building on recent research on the Indian and ocean trade or context between the Indonesian archipelago and the Ottoman Empire. Oops. Oh, I'm missing one. Oops, yeah. My own fault, I guess. An example would be this royal banner, which was used during ceremonies at the Yogyakarta court. It's clearly influenced by Ottoman iconography, as can be seen by feature, from features such as the calligraphic lion and the double-edged sword, uh, Zor Fakar. 
A more, uh, second, more imaginative approach could be informed by the work of scholars such as uh, historian Laurie Sears, who analyzed uh, Wayan Kulit, or Japanese um, shadow theater in relation to the Islamic faith and indigenous traditions. Or Laurie Ross, Ross' recent work on the topic uh, Chiribon, a mass dance from West Java in the context of, uh, context of changing Islamic discourses. Uh, and as well as the work of um, Mark Woodward, who studied uh, ceremonial life at the Kraton or Royal Court of Jakarta in central Java. Starting with the latter, um, I'll go back. This is a studio portrait of uh, Hamenko Buono VII, Sultan of Jakarta. He is wearing a jacket that is now in the Trophy Museum's collection and is in fact a copy of an older jacket. According to Japanese tradition, this jacket was a gift from the Prophet Muhammad himself. At the end of the, it's not a joke. <laughs> At the end of the, I can't explain all this, but then my paper will be long, more longer than 20 minutes. Um, at the end of the 15th century, and the jacket was preserved uh, in the palace as a pusaka, or a sacred heirloom. Despite the Islamic connections implied by these well-known um, Japanese interpretations, the Tropa Museum has never exhibited the jacket as part of Islamic tradition. On the contrary, the information provided with the object downplays any Islamic credentials by referring to the possible Hindu origins of the patchwork, patchwork pattern, which is called tambal, based on the fact that Hindu priests in the Tenga area of East Java wear similar garments, which, like the Sultan's jacket, are named on, uh, Kusumu. However, as uh, Woodward was the first to point out, if we look at the jacket beyond the search of an authentic core, the pattern can also refer to the patchwork cloaks associated with Sufi orders. This is just uh, one idea. Such a reading is even more likely since the Sultan did only wear this particular garment during Krabuk Mulut, or Maulid and Nebi, we would say in Arabic. A ceremonial context that, like my, many court rituals, was entrenched in Sufi symbolism. Such reinterpretations have not yet found their way into museum displays in the Netherlands or elsewhere in Europe. Even though museums in Southeast Asia and Australia have made first attempts to redefine Indonesia's Islamic heritage. The Islamic Arts Museum in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, has staged a number of exhibitions which adhere to the conventional understanding of Islamic art but now extended to include Southeast Asian objects. A more experimental exhibition was curated in 2006 by James Bennett of the Art Gallery of South Australia under the title Crescent Moon, Islamic Art and Civilization in Southeast Asia. Bringing together objects from various Southeast Asian and Australian collections, including the palace courts, the exhibition not only featured more obvious objects like Quranic manuscripts, but also Wayang puppets. And um, the catalog uh, describes their, their inclusion um, because although they were used in, in the performance um, of Hindu tales, this, this, um, um, this type of Wayang flourished after the arrival of Islam. And I quote the catalog here, it's almost always associated with Islamic occasions such as festivals. Um, it also includes a ceremonial dagger, of which the hilt is in the form of, the, of a mythical naga snake, and a topping dance mask, which was created for the Jogjakarta court. The selection of these objects was held together by a definition of Indonesian Islamic art, with strong emphasis on the objects used and created for the Muslim courts. While the curators acknowledge that, um, I quote the, the exhibition webpage here, Islamic architecture and ornamentation grew out of and absorbed numerous elements of previous Hindu Buddhist styles." Unquote. The dagger, for instance, was described as a court pusaka and a visual expression to the Islamic notion of the sacred role of kinship. It thus identified pusaka not only as an indigenous Indonesian form of heritage preservation, conform the work of Christina Krebs, but also as an expression of Islamic ideology. 
Of course, Wayang puppetry, topeng masks, and ceremonial weapons has o have also been featuring in many, numerous exhibitions at the Tropper Museum. But the authentic core paradigm precluded interpretation of these objects in an Islamic context, other than the often repeated statement that they lost much of their figurative appearance after the arrival of Islam. Well, my choice of these objects from the uh, Crescent Moon exhibition is not uh, coincidental because Batik, Wayang, and Chris Degas are the classical examples of Islamic art. So, what does this all mean for the field of Islamic art history? Having outlined the historical conditions that led to the Dutch colonial disregard of Indonesian Islam, my concluding remarks contend that this was only one of the factors leading to the exclusion of Indonesian objects from the do domain of Islamic art. Likewise, since its inception, the field of Islamic art has been based on the same 19th century idea of the center and periphery of Islam. The notion of unity of Islamic art that until recently dominated the field implied, implies that the artifacts and architecture of the so-called heartlands of Islam, i.e. the lands where Islam spread during its initial conquest, Exemplify the aesthetic criteria against which art produced in Muslim lands should be measured in order to qualify Islamic, as Islamic art. In other words, the neglect of Indonesia in Islamic art history is not coincidental, but the result of the emphasis on shared aesthetics that em emerged in early scholarship. If Islamic art essentially is art that is influenced by the visual language of Western Asia, much of what was produced in Indonesia simply doesn't qualify, even if it was produced for Muslim courts or for ritual use in Islamic ceremonies. In recent years, there has been a repeated call to expand the field of Islamic art to include Southeast Asia and other excluded areas. Such a movement will be the logical result of current debates on the conceptual parameters underpinning the canon. However, the consequences for the field of Islamic art may be for, more far-reaching than anticipated. It means that rather than looking through the prism of shared aesthetics, it would mean, as uh, Wendy Shaw recently put it, to look at Islam as a, complex of, uh, as a complex and flexible intellectual discourse, woven in and out of various temporal, geographical, cultural, and political contexts." For Indonesia can only be included when Islam is understood as a religious cultural field, stretching from Sub-Saharan Africa or Southeast Asia. Since the mid-20th century, the scholarly debate has been moving from the trope of unity of Islamic art to unity and diversity, and diversity and unity, as Avin Noam Shailim and others have pointed out. That expanding this, the scope of the canon to excluded regions like Southeast Asia would entail a further move to diversity, full stop. Thank you. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our speakers for four very, very uh, interesting papers. The last one in particular pertains so much to the thinking that we've been doing here in the Islamic Department uh, for all these years that we, we've been approaching the reinstallation of our collection. So thank you for your thoughts and for all of yours. And I invite all our speakers to take a seat up there on the far side of the stage where we can have a few questions. Thank you. So I had a question as far as the last presentation on Indonesia. And you had mentioned uh, trade. And I was wondering, did you look at all the influences from uh, Arabs coming in from the Hadramaut? Because there was a very, very substantial movement in the 19th century. And uh, in fact, I believe there was a family that made quite a bit of money uh, actually selling batik.
Thank you. Um, yeah, like I said, recently a lot of research has been done on the uh, Indian Ocean trade and also the, the presence of programs in Mecca and that sort of thing. Um, but um, as far as I know, very little of this research has been focused on what it implies for the arts or material culture. And um, our museum is full of objects that can underpin such research. We have 50,000 objects from Indonesia. So <laughs> I invite you all <laughs> to do this. Uh, could I ask a question? Uh, you haven't mentioned at all the activities of the uh, Dutch East India Company. And uh, uh, I did read uh, one rather crazy reference uh, in Indonesian folklore, and probably just some region of it, um, that uh, the founder of the Dutch East India Company was considered uh, one of the creators uh, of um, uh, life, as it were. And his name was Joseph Cohen. Um, very, no one's really explained this. I, I think it's in one of the Islamic encyclopedias. Uh, what was the influence of the Dutch East India Company? It's much earlier. Uh, also, it seems to me that um, there's very little on the actual transition of Islam uh, to Indonesia uh, prior to uh, the East India Company period. I mean, it's not documented. Um, you know, was, at what point uh, did uh, Islam actually move uh, from India uh, across there? Uh, and then lastly, the activities of the monsoon road. Uh, there's a lot of trade goods uh, in the Moluccan cemeteries and things which have been excavated, um, which have come from Iran and places. Um, so it, your story was very late. It was 19th century stuff. There's very little prior to that. Yeah, that's true. That's because my um, research is based on um, museum collections, and um, particularly the Tropic Museum's collection starts in uh, 1864, so long after the, um, the VOC was dissolved. <laughs> um, that's part of the problem. There's also a lack of material, Islamic material, from Indonesia uh, before the 19th century. Almost all the examples I showed um, are 19th century. And that is um, a result of, of what I um, explained, that a museum collection, all the older, uh, the, the collecting of the older material was geared toward the Hindu, Buddhist past, and Islamic antiquities was just not a field of museum collecting. Um, so I'm afraid that would be my answer. Can I just, uh, I'd just like to add, um, putting in a little word for a forthcoming MET project <laughs> that we, have, uh, we are hoping to organize an exhibition in, the, in late 2014 on the arts of the Deccan, where the Dutch East India Company will feature and its activities in the late 17th century in terms of trade across um, from the eastern coast of India and the story of that will feature to some extent in the show. So stay tuned. Um, but we don't have time for very many more questions. I see two on the floor. So Professor Guciani and yes. then afterwards. Uh, only a short comment on the last there, mehrab of Imam Reza showed by Kili. Uh, this mehrab is made in two different time, not all of it in one time. The, it was small and made by Abu Zaid ibn Muhammad ibn Abu Zaid and Naqash. And then a few years later, uh, another part aid to this, and we have three signatures on all the mihrab. One is that one which I mentioned, and then we have the signature of Abu Zaid and the signature of Muhammad ibn Abu Tahir, which according to my research, Muhammad Abu Tahir and Abu Zaid is the same person. The mihrab, all of this mihrab now in the museum, and uh, all the ties, the star ties, will be published maybe in the, will be come out in the next four months in one book I arranged for the Astana Quotes. Unfortunately, a lot of, of these ties, the star ties was destroyed 10, 15 years in bombing the place. They put a bomb there and many of these uh, last tile destroyed. Yeah. 
And uh, I think that the first part, which by Abu Zaid ibn Muhammad ibn Abu Zaid, that this potter, he is the same potter who made the last pottery in the Victoria Albert Museum, which have the signature of Muhammad ibn Muhammad and Nishaburi. He is the same of that. For this, we have two Abu Zaid, different Abu Zaid. This. Okay. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And I'm sure we all really look forward to your book. Um, when were the mihrabs moved to the Shrine Museum? It's a long time. It's now in the museum of the Astana Quds. Do you have any idea? 60s, 70s? I think it's about maybe 15, 20 years ago. Okay. Yeah, all of it, not only the large one. The two also by Ali ibn Abu Tah, ibn Muhammad ibn Rabta, all of it now in the museum. Thank you. I also had a question for Keelan about Nyman's films. For whom were they intended? Were they widely and publicly shown, or was it where you would request them for a, an audience that was, of, that was interested in them? That's a great question. Um, I think originally they were probably conceived for wide circulation because there was this propagandistic quality about them, both for American interest and Iranian interest. But I'm actually um, not quite sure um, what happened in terms of circulation. They're not that common. Uh, I think Nyman and his um, wife sent a few of the weaving of Persian rugs to specific museums, strong and textile collections. My understanding is that they sent one to the textile museum. And then if you check surveyors uh, in the section about the film, uh, the films by Annette Ittig, I think is her name. She, there's a little blurb at the end that says, um, video cassettes of Nyman's films are now available. Contact Masi Masume Nyman. So um, maybe um, they didn't circulate as widely because the Asia Institute, we all sort of understand what happened. Um, I can only guess, but um, they've really remained in the shadows, I think. I, I just found a couple copies at a university. Thank you. Okay, well, uh, thank you again very much, speakers, and to the audience as well for your attention, and I hand over for the last session of the afternoon. Thank you.